Deep Dive Film School makes no claim of ownership of the film footage used in this episode. The film footage is owned entirely by the copyright holders. Also, we're going to spoil the hell out of this movie, so this is your warning. Welcome to Deep Dive Film School! Oh, this week we're going to continue our Wong Kar Wai Fest with 1994's Chunking Express. Let's dive on in. I'm Adam Sherlock. And I'm Adam Pulcher. And if you like what you see slash here, please like and subscribe. You can find us in all the spaces and places that people what? Find good media. That is right. We got 101s. Only we got stuff. festivals. Uh, we have scene analyses. And uh, mm -hmm. we this is our second installment of Mr. Wong Kar Wai. Yeah, I'm very interested to see what you think of this movie. Yeah. Um, it, it's one that... You know, I think I've seen like half of, like, I think it was one mm. I fell asleep in. And, you know, right, right off the bat, you're kind of in this weird impressionistic, like quick style that yeah. you're shooting in. That yeah. It's a little jarring, honestly, if I'm being an audience member and, you know, never se seen this movie, like to my full capacity. Before. Yeah. Yeah. But There's this voiceover happening. This guy's telling us a story. And yeah, it's like these... It's almost like every third frame slow-mo of an action scene of running down. And are we in a POV? Like, yeah, yeah it's hard to following someone. And throughout the movie, it kind of becomes really more something around the action yeah. of what's happening. And it's an interesting place to start because it's almost the opposite of In the Mood for Love in, to a degree um, because it's very... It's definitely kind of lower budge kind of stuff, but it's more indie. Very um, indie. Right. Very, very and, indie. and, you know, it looks edgier, not as crisp, which is fine. You know, I mean, we got pagers and CDs here. We're in the 90s. We're right? definitely like, we're covering the fucking cranberries. Yeah. In movie. <laughs> so like <laughs> totally in the true. 90s. Yeah. So it's, um, you know, so it, that that's a really fun aspect of this where, you know, pre-technology, pre-internet, anything just... That's always a fascinating world to reflect on because being the age that we are, half of our life is probably in the internet and the other half, at least at this point, is is in the internet. Yep, deeply. exactly. So yeah. we're kind of in the z like area mm -hmm. um, to a degree, so we kind of can relate to a lot of people. And so, you know, we've seen indie movies and 90s movies like this, I think. And it's funny to kind of see him be a little more indie and punk rock, I guess. Well, and I think that that's exactly why this movie is, you know, when you <clears throat> when I was looking for this movie to watch it for this review, uh, when you search for this movie online, what comes up alongside of it is Slacker, mm -hmm. Reservoir Dogs, Clerks. It, it is, is that the era it came in? Yeah, okay. I, but but I don't think it's just because this movie came out in 94. I think it's because it was an indie darling, right? And well, I think true. there was something really special about you being like, this is 90s China. Yeah. And to see something that let's, I mean, there's a whole section of this movie that feels like it, it came right out of uh, a life less ordinary. Like it's like wow. super indie bubble gummy like we have our pixie dream girl here mm -hmm. uh you know who just wants to get away and then the guy who's too dumb to realize that the really cute girl that he's you know uh uh looking for is right in front of him the whole time, the whole time. like all of those kind of tropes to then be funneled through a 90s like mainland china dude like that is revolutionary and interesting and mm -hmm. awe-inspiring by its own merit regardless of whether or not the story is above par doing something new so tarantino said that he signed with miramax because he wanted to get films because he knew he was going to you know in very tarantino fashion knew he was going to be the biggest thing in the world right yeah, of course and um but it's because he wanted to get movies like chunking express more exposure I mean, to the Miramax library or whatever. And know. I could see that. Yeah. Like, I could see, I, like, it was kind of interesting. Like, I don't know, especially at a young, impressionable age. Yeah. Thinking about, like, hey, this movie from China, from this guy, it's more pretty people wild. need to see yeah, it. Like, yeah. you're not, this isn't your everyday movie. Well, and I think and it's not. So let me ask you this. When you watched this, did you know that it was two separate stories? 
I knew that it was kind of about two cops that kind of basically lose their, they get dumped by their girlfriends, basically, right? That's pretty much all I knew. But how they tell the story, very interesting here. The choices he makes. Um, I was reading, he kind of filmed this movie like a road movie. And he wrote each scene either the night before or in the morning in the day of filming. Again, a trend that we're seeing, mm. like that we... That kind of, same kind of free guerrilla filmmaking it's, style. It's very interesting. And the fact that, you know, it almost reminds me of um, the Duplass brothers, right? Where they're just kind of, um, hey, we're turning on the cameras. Um, you're funny, you're funny, you're a great actor, you guys can all be whatever, you know, just... Yeah, it turns out later, a... the chair is the center of the movie, oh, yeah, and that's the chair, we'll all the movie one. that. But, well, but, and I agree, and I think... Do you see what I mean, it. though? Like, yeah. it's just kind of like, is is he doing that because of the limitations of his government? That is wild if he is. Could very well be the, the reason why, and I think that <clears throat> you're right that those limitations, uh, creativity can blossom from it. I'll say that for myself... Not knowing that this was two pretty much almost totally separate stories. There's the thinnest of threads <laughs> that our first cop, which I believe is cop four, four, they, they're, they don't two, even two, have three. They, there's two, two, three. And then the second six, one is six, 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 eight. I think so. Two, two, three uh, meets our pixie six, dream six, girl. Eight. That was close. Uh, meets our pi pixie dream girl. Um, because that's also where he gets his chef salads. And then that's how <laughs> yeah. we introduce her. And then we never see him again. I didn't know that going into it. And I'll just say right now, like, I know that this movie is like an indie darling from the 90s, but I didn't really like it. Mm -hmm. Um <laughs> <laughs> and I think the reason why is because I didn't know there were two separate stories. I went in completely blind and I kept Which waiting. Thing. That should be how you go into a movie. I kept waiting to come back to this first story Which because of closure for the other story. Well, the first story. So, so our, our two stories. Uh, yeah. You're, I think you, that's a great way, a great synopsis to say we have two cops, uh, both in the same city, um, both been dumped by their girlfriends and trying to figure out how to kind of navigate around that. Mm -hmm. And the first story is a cop who young cop, young, young cop who, uh, gets, gets dumped meets and it becomes infatuated with this woman who's obviously in disguise. She's in this wig. She never takes her sunglasses off. She wears this raincoat all the time and she is nefarious. Like she, uh, is a drug smuggler, um, who in this early scene brings together this Indian family and has them. She's basically at the airport with their passports. They're all stuffed with a bunch of drugs. Even the kids are, and we're like, what's going to happen? And then when she goes over to negotiate with the, the clerk, the desk clerk, she comes back and they're all gone. <laughs> and so now she's on this mad dash to try and find, they have all of her drugs mm -hmm. and she literally kidnaps a kid. <laughs> right. And so it's like, we become so interested in whatever her life is like as this drug runner. And then later the cop becomes infatuated with her and they're at a bar together. But the next scene is to me in my You're estimation kind of scenes, there's a lot that goes on in between. Well, but, but they go to this, this hotel room together and yeah. it's kind of, she's so tired that she falls asleep and he stays up watching old movies. And then we sort of fast forward to a kind of gnarly assassination of this drug dealer who's the one that kind of uh was trying to steal drugs from her and she the reason comes, she has the blonde wig and right and she yeah. and she kills this guy like on screen and you're kind of like oh fuck a couple other things happen obviously i'm 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 jumping across a lot of really important stuff which we'll talk about in a second but then we get to our second story which is like the opposite of the first story it's this almost meat cute of like I said, like and you don't even see the girl right there in front of you who's likes you this whole time, mm -hmm. and we never revisit the first story. And I'm like, dude, like if you did want to do these two stories, tell the meet cute one first, mm. and then do the one where there's like murder and drug runners, because otherwise, point. like you can't fucking compete. I'm sorry, like that girl. I don't know the actress's name that has the pixie cut. Mm -hmm. She is cute as as all all get out like mm -hmm. she is deeply deeply cute i was infatuated with her that being said neither her nor tony leong 
can hold a candle to whatever the fuck was going on with the raincoat lady. <laughs> I want to, I want to like, stick with her. Every moment the raincoat lady is not on screen, we're cheated because it's so much more interesting. She kidnaps a kid and then feeds the kid ice cream while meanwhile being like, you ever want to see your kid again? Yeah, you ever want to see your kid again? Like, she's hard as fuck, but, like, I'm so curious about her, and she's gone. Yeah. And so every moment that you I'm, fell like... fell in love with the character. Well, never every happened. moment that I'm, like, will they, won't they, between Tony Leung, the pixie dream girl, and fucking California dreaming, I'm just, like, so, I felt cheated. <laughs> so the, the writing, the scenes, the night of, and the morning of didn't work as well as it did with In the Mood for Love here. It doesn't, like, if they want, if he wanted it to be a vignette, it should have been like five short vignettes. So this was. Or something. Yeah. Like, it just felt, I don't know how this turns into one movie. It's definitely not a linear movie uh, uh, as well, like... Um, or even thematically. Life. Even thematically, the two themes are so wildly different. Yeah. That it felt... Again, if I was if I was seeing this for the first time in 94 when shit like Slackers was coming out... For sure. Then maybe I'd be like, oh my God, and this came out of China? Yeah, give this guy more exposure. I would totally say that. It's stylized beautifully. It looks amazing. Yeah. But it... I don't know that it, I was deeply unsatisfied by the time it ended. Yeah. I, you know, I don't, I don't think I hated it as much as you did. Um, but I can see your trepidation for it. And that's why I said at the beginning, I'm like, I'm very curious to see. Tell me your because, thoughts. Cause I kind of went on a diet you know, for a minute. Yeah, then. no, I think it's fine. You know, I, I liked some aspects of it. I think there was some cool stuff. I did too. On here. I liked a lot and, of aspects. And I think, especially for a nineties film and understanding the world that this is being made in, where I'm sure just make, being a filmmaker in China alone is hard oh, unless God, you're yeah. shooting something for the government. So, so, you know, he has to improvise a bit and his movies feel that. And I, I think it's kind of what I was saying earlier about, yeah, the improv improvisation maybe didn't work as well, but there was still moments and relationships that I cared about and that I liked. And there was, it was, it looked amazing um, for the most part, but it was very indie. You could tell that it was a lot more lower budget and they were really flying by the sea of their pants a little more here. Um, but I'm with you. I, I, I was infatuated with her as well. Like she has this just kind of like, you know, infectious energy and someone who's cranking the mamas and papas that loud. I'm going to, I'm going to be interested in it. Maybe there's not that many times. I know, I'm <laughs> kidding. Um, but there's, it's there's... like hearing, it's like hearing, uh, 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 what's the fucking song from the graduate? The, the first oh, time it's like, Robin. everybody, no, not that one. The, everybody's looking at me. Or maybe that's in Midnight Cowboy. Anyway, no, you, you hear uh, that song and the first time you're like, yeah. And by the 33rd time they use it, you're like, okay, all right. Yeah. We're, uh, uh, which Cassidy are you listening? <laughs> um, yes. But the woman in the blonde wig, I do, I do love, you know, we start and it does seem like it, it, it is two different movies and you know, maybe that's all a relationship is this guy, this cop in the first half is pretty much a dummy but he has some interesting themes his whole thing about jogging and getting all the excess water out when you're sad i love that the one with the expiration date and his and that's the other one. Yep. his conversation with the clerk about the expiration date that's why i was like these feel like little short films mm -hmm. and like because there's its own level of weirdness of similar uh quirks in the second one and really if you think about it that is a very 90s indie trope sure um think about a movie like clerks right it's like it's a bunch of disparate one act scenes strung together around the theme of like oh this guy's girlfriend broke up with him and he's Damn not even life. supposed to be working yeah. here today right and it's strung together and so then it makes sense and so i'm like if it wasn't so back heavy on just that second story uh the one with the pixie girl in it if, like I said, if there were five short vignettes, I'd probably love this movie. Yeah. And they had tangentially connected together. But instead, it was just like I kept waiting to come back to the first story. Like, it would have, what would have been amazing again? I'm rewriting it. Yeah. A, I thought there would be the more 90s. crossover. Well, like, if it turned out that our, that our girl who works in the restaurant or works at the cafe 
was the woman in the way. And that's honestly where I thought it was probably going. Me too. And how they were going to kind of interconnect it, and they never really did. No, it's they're not connected at all. And or she worked for the woman because, in the way. You know, way, and I'm not someone who begs for an explanation for a movie or whatever, and I, I don't think you are either. Mm-mm. Um, But, yeah, I, I can see how you could feel a little unsatisfied by that. Yeah. Um, I, I didn't as much, but I can, I can see where the yearning for that is. Because, I don't know, I, you balance... Hey, dude, you go and do some weird shit and try and be effective in a different way. I'll applaud you for that. Always. Um, Completely. And, I and totally so, agree. But, you know, it doesn't always necessarily work every time. But I did I did like this movie. I did like I, I it had moments that had me, you know, his whole thing with the pineapple and the expiration dates. Like you're saying, I love the expiration date thing. And at first I was just like, man, it's so weird searching for these expiration dates on cans for these pineapples and it has to be pineapples it has to be this date and that's his measurement of time for love like he's like well if if she doesn't call me before this date then you know but then you see these moments where the blonde wig lady um wishes him happy birthday and it makes him the happiest and i love that i love that i wish that so there's moments i wish that we would have had more interesting interactions between the woman in the wig and him. It seems like he comes up, he's hitting on her. She's exhausted. He's very she's... healthy eater, by the way. Oh yeah. No, right. yeah. I, he, he's he like, said he had four cob salads. He or said he had four fucking <laughs> chef salads. And I'm like, like what? And then five other meals. Like, I'm well, she here. seems so interesting, and her voiceover is very interesting and smart. Everyone his, gets a voiceover. I his do like voiceover. That. I did too. And his voiceover is really interesting and smart. And then he just kind of hits on her in the bar. They have very uninteresting conversation. Oh, it, everything he's doing is a swing and a miss. Yeah. And yeah. then they go back to a hotel, and she just sleeps. And I was like. And it was kind of a like I was like it's kind of a missed There's opportunity. No relation of anything. Yeah, like they they could have had a really interesting conversation, and maybe that was the point of that. Although it didn't land with me the way that it could have. Now maybe that is more like real life, and that these two stories are never connected, and that's probably what happens a lot. It's like, hey, this just happened in the same city on the same night, or totally. Whatever. So you and know, that same and, restaurant to like you know what does a restaurant have to do with things? There's a lot of unanswered questions for and, sure. And I will fully say. That this movie is celebrated and loved, so I may have just missed something. There might, who knows? And maybe it was something about it being in the 90s and that indie sense that I was talking about where, Mm -hmm. yeah, maybe it's a more traditional themes and ideas. Because, like, the first, you know, again, it's like what people say about, you know, from dusk till dawn. It's like the first 30 (laughs) minutes is an amazing Tarantino movie. (laughs) And then all of a sudden there's vampires, right? And we everything goes out the window. I feel the same way. It's like the first 20 minutes of this is an amazing 90s, again, very Reservoir Dog-esque like crime movie that I wanted to watch the rest of. And somebody changed the channel on me to a kind of will they, won't they uh, it's 90s true. I, indie romantic comedy. You know, I really, like, huh? I really like purely on situation alone. There, there, there's missed opportunities here, but like, hey, he's a fucking cop. You're a drug dealer, and you guys are having a conversation. Neither of you know what's going on. Yeah, like that could be a lot more interesting of a story. Yeah, it could we, go where we could like really grasp onto to some, um, you know, dualities. Totally. Well, and like I said, like when I f- first saw her getting that whole Indian family and packing them with a bunch of dope to get on an airplane. I was like, fucking giddy up. I'm ready for this, you yeah. know? And then it goes somewhere else and different, then it, which then is it goes, fine, yeah. but, but it doesn't even go somewhere different with characters that we've established that we're invested in. Um, all that being said, the direction here, when it isn't doing those weird, uh, really kinetic POV style stuff, um, when it settles down, holy shit, this thing looks amazing. Yeah. Again, we are seeing a style here. Uh, we talked about when we did uh, in the mood for love where it's like, he clutters the frame with all this shit that a DP would be like, get, yeah, get all this. You got to move the camera like 10 feet forward, dude. Like there's all this stuff here. And, and he, even with something as indie looking as this, the deft hand of there's one shot in particular and it's, it's in front of the actual little express deli. Yep, he loves windows. I know which scene you're going to talk about. And, and we've got trying to. We got Tony Leong here drinking coffees again. The dumbass staring with the letter. off. 
Well, not even that one. It's a different one. I think it's it's after that. And he's staring off, just sipping on his coffee and like, and she's at the other end of the counter looking at him. And it's just a two shot, right? And all the stuff yeah. in the background. And they, oh, I agree. That's and great. yeah, we can see everybody running I around in the background. And I was like, oh my God, like it's he, so gorgeous. He does this thing where, where he keeps that impressionist part at the beginning. Yeah. And but puts it on a two shot of two still people. And so just plays it in front of it or totally something. or everything behind it. Yeah. Right. And they're in the foreground and like all the other people working in the deli are running around in the background. Movie magic. There's That's another like amazing. <laughs> there's another amazing one that I've only ever seen this effect. I don't know what this effect is, but the only other time I've seen it is actually with, um, Oh, Yorgos, uh, what's the guy that did? Yeah, the most, yeah. Uh, yeah, that did uh, Mandy and... and uh, Oh, no, no, that's a different guy. Uh, Beyond the Black Rainbow. I can't think of... I might be saying his name, but if he has a Greek name, but um, put it up here. Uh, when she doesn't pay the power bill and mm. the power goes off and they just have all those candles, there's some smear effect. And I don't... It might just be Vaseline on the lens. I don't know. But it makes the actual flame of the candle look like it's about a foot long. Yeah. It does these weird red stretches. He's the only other person that I've ever seen do that effect. Really he does cool. It, he does it in Mandy, and then he does it in the um, Gilmore del Toro uh, uh, Cabinet of Curiosities or whatever. Okay. Where it is. It's this, like, smeared lens effect, and it's, like gorgeous like every shot when the power goes out and they have those candles i'm like i was just spellbound yeah. like just by that and so there are these moments like that even when you're like yeah he's still doing guerrilla filmmaking running around a city where he needs to have permits that he probably never fucking got yeah. where he's able to do these magical magical directorial moments as a full story though i understand the holes there you know like when she is searching you know in the second story where she basically steals this letter and finds the keys to his apartment and she's going through and she's like replacing the, the the last act is her just subtly replacing things in his apartment, but also still cranking up the the mamas and the, the papas, papas. And, and 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 then just like doing these little subtle things to make him a better person, which like that's kind of, that's a cool concept. I, like that's a cool idea. Yeah. But also, what is your motivation here? What are you doing? Well, like, and also cute things, cute things in romantic comedies from era from bygone eras now just smack of being like deeply disturbed people if some girl was fucking breaking into my apartment daily to like go through all That's my why I thought, tie me up tie me down had that and same way same way yeah it's same like way it, that part has aged poorly and the other thing i would say about that too is that it's like dude he tony luong might be the worst fucking cop in all of mainland china <laughs> if he doesn't notice that she's going through and replacing like I, like I get that he's like that he's like oh you know he's he's telling his soap like you're too thin and then later it gets fat and he's like the atta boy and I'm like no a stranger I mean basically a fucking stranger is breaking into your house yep. and replacing your dish rag and you're talking to it like it's a person. I get it. It's yeah, that's cute. right. He's talking to all these inanimate it's objects. It's cute on one level. And on another level, the suspension of disbelief to be like, you're all insane. Like this doesn't, on some level, you are the worst cop on the planet because. Do you do you think there is some Terrence Malick influence? It's like magical realism that it's like. There's like symbolism that's not meant to be taken literally. Yeah. Yeah. I wondered about that. And I, I do think so, although it's hard. It, I think so. But at the same time, it's like either you play fully by those rules or you don't. Yeah. And yeah, whether it be Ter Terrence Malick, whether it be, uh, uh, just with the Spike Jones, Jones, especially if you're writing like, this every morning or the night before, like, yeah, you're, it's hard. you're gonna like, that's how your mind works is in those days and what influenced you that day. What are you thinking about that day? That's mm. what became in the script. And if they were vignettes like you were talking about, it would make more sense. But if you're trying to make a whole story out of it, the pieces don't always fit. Okay. That's really interesting. And maybe, or, you know, a, a, another version of that magical realism, uh, different than Terrence Malick, but just as powerful. And if you don't understand it, just as off-putting that might be happening here, 
depending on the next couple of movies we watch of his. Yeah. Maybe it's a David Lynch thing, right? Where it's like, if you don't understand that Lynch will sell all reality for one idea to get across a point, if you don't know that and then you watch Blue Velvet, you're like, I hated it, right? So but you're if wondering you watched, if that's a thing, a trick, that's what I'm saying, maybe. Right? Like, yeah. if you've watched a bunch of David Lynch films, then you're like, Blue Velvet's amazing. But if you don't know that and you're treating it like a regular movie, yeah. then you don't like it. So interesting, it's yeah. quite possible, everybody, that after our next two movies in this festival, I'll come back and say, actually, I love Chunking Express because now I get what he's doing. Sure, and that's the, that's the joy of going through these. Because all that being said... Is there moments like that in in the mood for love? Nope. Not not that I can point to. I gotta, obviously, I gotta say these are two very unusual female characters as well, don't you think? Mm-hmm. Like this is like one of them is a drug dealer who's just kidnapper, pulling fucking the most ready, you know, pretty ruthless th- lady. Yeah. That he wants to fall in love with. And then the next girl, she's a masochist to a degree. And she is sneaking into these apartments, yeah. to his apartment, because she's obsessed with him, but won't admit it. But and, she's also the classic uh, pixie dream girl. I mean, she is Natalie Portman from Garden State, right? She is like, mm-hmm. you got to listen to this song. We got to move to California. And he's like, Blue California. It's literally huh? literally right? called like, California Dream. Yeah, I mean, and he is the stuffy, like, I, I never... You know, like, even though he has a whole bedroom full of fucking stuffed animals, I mean, that's a red flag, And then she changes them? Weird. Yeah, I don't know. It doesn't... So maybe it's possible that as we get to know him as a director, this movie makes more sense. Sure. But on its face, there were things about it that really rattled me in a way where I wanted to enjoy it more. There are amazing moments in this movie, though. I will say that there are amazing moments I loved. I just couldn't, I couldn't get in. I couldn't find my way in. I think I liked it a little more than you, but I think we're very on a very similar page here. I I even thought the ending of their story too was just kind of like, that's a, is that too perfect? It's fucking corny. It's corny. I thought the whole, like wherever you like, to me, it's like the line in singles where it was like, I was no, nowhere near your place or whatever that one liner is. It's like some Jerry Maguire shit. I don't know. I just, and maybe the fact of the matter is, is that me the money. Well, and maybe, well, you complete me, whatever, like, you know, you have me at hello, whatever that shit is, like, whatever it is that they did. And maybe it was just the fact that this was taking place in China, that this movie was made there, yeah. and that that was the novelty and what made it such a darling when it came out. Because I can put myself back and there. It's and it's edgy. It's got the, the edge to yeah, it. Yeah. And so I get that. I totally get that. I don't. And it's funny how yeah. quickly, I mean, you think of something, this is maybe a weird comparison, but you think of, um, I, th- I forgot the name of the documentary where South Park makes their show in seven days or something like oh, that. Oh, right. Yeah. So they yeah. can pull off of these influences on a daily basis. Like Trump did something, they can joke about it. And this was immediately, episode, right? right? Right. Um, or something like this, if you're writing every day, again, like you're pu- you're like, oh, last night I watched Reservoir Dogs for the first time. I'm going to have this. I'm going to put this, in this scene of this drug deal. Know, or whatever. Well, and, so and like I the guess influences it, of the day, I don't know. Maybe that has something to do with That's that. a really good point. And I guess I would say then I wish there was a maybe a co-writer or a co-editor that was like, hey, this is really top heavy with violence and drugs. And then the second half is this cute, you know, rom-com like – Let's do a third act, you know, let's do, I guess I was just looking, I was looking for more of that Pulp Fiction-y, because Pulp Fiction is also silos of stories that yeah. don't necessarily it's tell one of, thing. Yeah. But I'm like, that's why I'm like. If but there's it, connections. There. Or even a movie like Grand Canyon. I'm like, if there were four or five silos of stories, then I would be, I wouldn't care, right? I would mm-hmm. say this is my favorite of them. But instead it's just the two and that made it a little rough, but. Well. That's us trying to understand this one. Um, and I'll be winners. No, and and honestly, I and did, it is a winner. It's I, just me. I did not hate. I did not hate this. This movie. I didn't hate it either. I would not say I hated but this movie. But it does but... have its problem. Yeah, and you know, I'm sure um, those have been batted about as well. So, um, you know, please follow along, Wong Kar Wai. I am, like you said, I'm very interested to see these next two and yeah. what those happen because Elmo Dovar, when we did him. Um, I wasn't really, sh- I, we watched like we did this time, the one movie that I had seen yeah. and then, and then we did the rest of the fest. 
get into the skin I live in, you're just like, oh fuck, what, holy god, yeah. Here, so let's see. <laughs> So I'm excited yeah. um, to do the the ones we're coming up. I don't know them off the top of my head, but um, you know, click follow along. Uh, please like and subscribe, and uh, come on the ride with us. That's right. And next week we're going to be doing that one scene from The Witch. You know the scene. I mean, I I think I do. Okay. All right. <laughs> I hope I do. All Thanks right. We'll see you guys next time.